Hi, I am Rich Duisberg and welcome to episode two of my Carl Mag podcast. Not really a podcast, is it? I'm doing it on video, but hey, I'm winging it and we'll see how we get on. Um, following feedback from the last podcast, it seems that more people are interested in some of the older stuff and reminiscing than they are the new. I say some of the feedback. Uh, this has had uh, 70 odd views for episode one, so I'm not entirely sure who's watching or indeed if it's even worth bothering with. But um, well, I hope you're listening and I'm going to waffle on about these magazines in this issue. We've got the March 2023 issue of Car Magazine. We've got issue 21 of Classic Retro Modern. We've got a copy of the 1963 Motor Show uh, preview from the Daily Express, which is more interesting than you might at first assume. Uh, this, which is a cult cool classic, this is Jalopy from September, October 92. This is really funny. Um, a dip into a review from Autosport uh, from 1985. And then finally this, this is very old indeed. This is 99 years old. This is a August 27, 1924 issue of Punch magazine. Not a lot of motoring content, but there's some interesting ads and a couple of funny old car ads in there as well, which I thought you might like to see. So uh, without further ado, let's jump in to Jalopy. So this leads with French Lessons, the CV's CV. And this is the uh, the two CV dolly, of course, here. And as with all of these, you get a banger guide inside. This magazine was, it was on sale for a few years on and off, and uh, it was actually quite difficult to, to track down. You notice like this slightly chromed effect, and then they've got this nice kind of rust and uh, cross-headed screws that don't quite match. Uh, fitting the, the logo there to the front page and it was a bit of a cult thing really. Um, the editor I think was once described as being the first man in Radnorshire to get uh, to break down in a Maserati. It's all like full of self-deprecating nonsense which is really why it appeals to me and the other feature vehicles in this one is a hundred pound Daimler so that's a similar style to the old uh, Series 1 XJ6 Jag and uh, it says little Chevy Coupe and it actually uh, refers to the Chevrolet, Corv uh, Chevrolet Corvette, I wish, the Vauxhall Chevette, uh, which was my first car as well. So this really pushed my buttons. I'm very grateful to a friend uh, who loaned me this uh, issue. So we'll just uh, bomb through this and see we've got quite a few magazines to get through this issue. So I'm not going to dwell too long on some of the more uh, ordinary stuff. So in a previous issue of this magazine, they gave away a Skoda, I think it was a Skoda Rapide, so people had to write in, and this is a story here of uh, the winning lady, who was a bit of a Skoda fanatic, um, who who won it and basically drove the length of the country to, to pick it up. Um, I really love that they gave away a Skoda, and of course, when was the last time you saw one of these on the road? And that's pretty cool. Uh, letters in there, and um, yeah. Honda, fabulous, Skodas, pitfalls of insurance, and then Jimmy Tadpole, I really hope somebody's called Jimmy Tadpole, I suspect it's a made up name, but uh, hey, you're not the only ones doing that, I do the same. Um, this is a guide to the Citroen 2CV, so of course, um, starting with the history of it, Andre Citroen was an inspired engineer with definite ideas about how cars carrying his name should be. During the Depression years of the 30s, he refused to be told what to make by people who knew who cared only about money. And as a result, his company became bankrupt in 1935, and Citroen himself died shortly after. I love that. It's just like poking fun at it before it even started. Um, yeah, wonderful things. So, uh, zip through the different uh, models here. Everything from the Ami, which of course we know, bigger and even stranger. Uh, and it used the uh, flat four engine from the Citroen DS. Uh, the Bijou, glass fibre based oddity once made in Slough, and the Mahari, uh, mini moped type cross country vehicle. This like really interesting versions of the 2CV. Never thought I'd say that. And these were cars that I kind of laughed at a bit back in the day, but came to appreciate them for the interesting engineering that, uh, that they have. Here, somebody called Heon Stevenson uh, has bought uh, Daimler Vanden Pla for £100 and basically talks about it breaking down. Um, yeah, stories of upset passengers, yeah, don't touch that switch, uh, your door doesn't open, yes it does smoke, and do you want to buy it? Um, and basically, yes, it breaks down and costs him a fortune in repairs, but fabulous. And again, these 
These are worth a lot of money now, and this celebrates the era of when they were worth not very much, and they were a more interesting alternative to cheap and nasty new stuff that you could have bought. Chevy Chevy Coupe, this really is the Vauxhall Chevette. Um, I think my reg was CFP284T. This one pictured here is XKY790T, and without even looking, I'm gonna know that this thing is dead on the, uh, is it still alive MOT history database. These were really good cars, and this one here talks about being one of the cheapest cars you could get, doing it up on a shoestring, and here it's described as being awesome thing, which I quite like. Um, yeah, ended up uh, in a scrappy, and, uh, and there we go. Um, I love mine, it was actually quite a robust and fun rear wheel drive car to have, and you know, today when people are spending stupid money on things like Mark II Escorts, I'm gonna argue that the Chevette was actually pretty good, wheelie engine aside. Um, adverts from Moggy Miners. Uh, Vauxhall Viva, there's another name that's uh, been brought back. I don't know if they still make the new shape Viva. Commie Car Secrets Revealed. This magazine really embraced Skodas, and of course we now know that Skoda has got a, a long and interesting engineering history. These cars at the time were fairly derided, but actually they were nowhere near as bad uh, as people made out. So here, special secret Skoda contraband compartment. A pillow for the children is optional. Um, yeah, great fun. Uh, advert about Capri's and bombing through here. This was quite nice. Nowadays, of course, it's very difficult to make a living from uh, from selling your stories in print, and we'll come on to that later because I'll write for a couple of the mags you might see scattered around my coffee table. Um, but here, look, write in, tell us about your joy of owning uh, cars, and it says it suggests here. Uh, don't write in with why my 1963 Slumber Septic is the best car ever made, which I think is quite funny. And basically they want stories about running or enjoying dodgy old motors, and for which you'll get paid 25 quid, which back then was quite a bit of money, and even now I'd be quite happy to pay 25 quid for this blather. Modest and distinctive. Um, here, this is described as the dream car. This is the... Uh, Austin 1100 and the various BMC versions of it. Really, really dreadful car, I have to say, um, but they love it. So, yeah, a wonderful thing. I want to bomb through to the buyer's guide in the back, and it's quite interesting here. It isn't just, how do I put this? It isn't just celebrating the decrepit British stuff in here. They really do um, enjoy things like uh, Matras, for example, uh, Simcas and other marks that you might not have heard much of. Um, and here it's like, it actually talks up Porsche. So here, after designing a Beetle, Ferdinand Porsche set up his own company producing lightweight versions of basically the same thing. That's one to get the Porsche fans uh, raging, isn't it? Comparing a Beetle with a 911. Even the latest 911s are clearly direct descendants of the original people's car. The outstanding performance and handling of these rear engine cars, despite their illogical layout, must be an achievement as great as when God made bumblebees fly. Wow, fantastic. Um, and uh, it's hard to, uh, to disagree with that. Miseries of the East, so uh, Japanese cars that aren't much cop. And uh, Scandinavian cards are described as Fjord Cortinas, which I think is, uh, is quite amusing as well. I do like a bit of wordplay and a bit of waffle in the back there from a chap called Mark Williams, who's basically running around and enjoying Bangonomics, things like uh, Riley 1500s and Renault 4s, and he's basically begging the readers to lend them a car. Uh, I blew up my Cortina on the M40, and that's when we reached a point in our relationship where the cost of replacing it with another old nail may be less than repairing it. So it says here, I wonder if anyone out there could lend me their car for a week or two, I'll look after it. Um, actually begging for a banger to run around in. Uh, that's Jalopy 92. See if you can find a copy on eBay or Beg, Borrow and Steal one. Thank you very much to my friend for lending me that. I think it's a great magazine. From Jalopy, I'm going to jump in to Car Magazine. This is the March 23 issue of Car Magazine, Honda vs. The World. In the previous uh, issue of my waffly little podcast thing, uh, we ran through the, the same month's issue of Evo, and a lot of the content is the same. So they've got this uh, ruggedized Porsche 911 doing the Dakar thing, and talk about uh, the new Honda Civic, uh, which also covers things like the uh, the Golf R and the Hyundai R30, and the Audi RS3. I don't know whether these were set up on the same shoot or not. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because honestly, and I appreciate this isn't a very kind thing to say, five pound twenty-five. 
I really regret spending £5.25 on this. It doesn't tell me anything like, it doesn't really catch my attention. I'm sure somebody's going to uh, enjoy it, but much of the content was covered by Evo, and there's not a lot that gets me in. However, I will say, Ben Miller, to, ben Miller the editor here, uh, describes uh, a trip uh, to the uh, Tizian Tichka Pass in Morocco, uh, where he was up there, uh, I believe, um, in the 911 Dakar, or I think his BMW motorbike. But anyway, um, I've been here. I went and did this in a metro, just because I'm a bit of a motoring masochist, so I kind of know what I'm talking about a little bit. And it says here, the humbling scale and savage beauty of the place, together with the tangible warmth of its people, is the magic of Morocco. Talk about the tangible warmth of its people. Um, I actually wrote a feature about getting mugged by a copper, basically, and having to pay a bribe. And almost everybody met was hostile, trying to rip us off, rip us off, or diddle us somehow, or was uh, in your face aggressive. And maybe that's me. Maybe my face. Uh, maybe my face doesn't make friends. But uh, yeah, awesome place to drive. Horrible place to go to make new friends, or it was for me anyway. So I want to skip through uh, Car Magazine because there isn't a lot in here that really holds my attention. Uh, Grenadier Golf G60, to be fair, it's quite an interesting thing, and um, yeah, basically uh, similar sort of content that we saw in the Evo. I will say that this 911 Dakar looks very silly, and I love it very much. I think it looks fantastic. So yeah, I regret spending 5.25 on uh, on Car Magazine. So we're going to skip on. We're going to skip on to this. This is the April 23 edition of Classic Retro Modern. So Classic Retro Modern. I love the uh, the strap line here. It's all right if you like this sort of thing. I do like this sort of thing. I think it's great. Uh, top marks are going with a pink cover. I think that's exceptionally brave. Um, so full disclosure, I actually contribute to this uh, to this magazine, and you'll see my name mentioned in the front somewhere. Um, I'm not going to dwell on the features that I've written, um, but I will mention them. So there are two features here called Lost Love, and these are cars that we've owned, loved, and sold on. Uh, in my in my case here. This is an Alpha GTV V6, which was just amazing thing. Uh, it's an amazing engine wrapped up in a pretty body and lashed together in a fairly slapdash fashion, I would say. Um, slightly relieved when I'd sold it, but looking back at these little wheels, these Teledyre wheels now, I sort of regret it uh, in a way too. Um, and then my Porsche 968. I bought these before these were trendy and the hipsters got hold of them and they were worth a lot of money and I sold it for quite a bit of money um, simply because it was worth more than it more to somebody else than it was to me. It sounds a bit strange but I had my fun in it. But this was a really great car. Um, but the real reason I think for, for this is really applauding the fact that, and excuse the awkward pun there, but uh, this Daihatsu applause and the Rover R8 series, and is it a classic, the Volvo C30? These are like really, on one hand, fairly humdrum motors. On the other hand, they're pretty unusual now. You don't see many of them on the road anymore. And indeed, at the back of this magazine, so I don't forget to cover it, there is a feature zipping through the using the How Many Left website. And you can see that certain cars, for example, I think the uh, Skoda Favourite was in there, it shows there's only like 1,400 examples of those left taxed and running on the road when at one time you could literally look out your window uh, and see loads of them. So, um, yeah, it's celebrating those things that are on the cusp. Um, yeah, this is a photograph from r and 92 on the Mondeo. This magazine's big on running uh, old adverts, which I kind of like, actually. Um, can't buy any of these things, of course, but, uh, but they're great. Look at this Tatra T603. Isn't that absolutely magnificent? Um, if you're bored of this, I suspect you probably are, um, have a quick look on YouTube for an advert by Tatra called Happy Journey. It's a, um, oh, I'm not going to spoil it, it's a two-piece advert which I think is an absolute work of art um, with a Tatra T603 bombing through the snow in the Czech Republic. Lovely cutaway of the month, Fiat 126. I'm a big fan of old Fiats, as you might know. Um, Periodicals Paradise, which I guess is sort of what I'm doing here really, but this is uh, reminiscing about, uh, I think this is a US magazine called Sports Car Graphic um, from 1968. Um, wow, yeah, old adverts, 
uh, something on the Retromobile show in Paris, which is something I've never been to and I've always wanted to. Some really cool stuff. Look at this, a Twingo turning 30, I think it is. And this is like, again, a, a car that you once saw every day uh, in France on the streets. Nowadays, you don't see them so often. And those you do see have got that lovely scabrous lacquer faded paint. Uh, and I really like one of these. Old news through the decades, 73, 83, 93, looking at different models that were launched. Owners clubs. More on the more on the Twingo. Check out this guy in his suit with his uh, big brick of a telephone. Yeah, I don't know if she's asking for directions or what? Oh, actually, it's a right-hand drive. Yeah, this is a, a little whiff of sexism. Whereas nowadays, uh, you know, we're all about equality and working harder on that. Back then, which isn't that long ago, yeah, you're going to see cars driving in the in, uh, men driving in the car adverts and uh, the women sat in the passenger seat. Um, it's just a awfully sexist way of looking at it, really. A nice bit of balance there with the restoration show with a lady spannering away at something. Don't know what it is, should know. Avanti. Now, uh, they did a uh, they did a poll on Twitter to see if people like Coupe Space uh, as much as the magazine does. And everybody basically said yes. 86% of the people said uh, yes. Some of the comments here. Wonderful device, incredible design. The quirkiness is overrated. It's not even that weird. I think you're wrong. Vert at whatever. Um, and I believe this is going to appear on the cover of the next issue. Um, a trips Anadol, something in Japan. Some fabulous uh, sheddy uh, pictures here. Uh, old Ford vans, Renault 5s, more Skodas. Check out the Rover Tomcat uh, Cup. This is the Dunlop Turbo Cup. Um, massive fun. And again, another car that you used to see so many of and now you don't see quite so often. These were great performers. Uh, I was at, uh, I used to work at Cowley occasionally and uh, a couple of the guys working there had these as company cars and we may have one weekend done a swap with um, one of these and my company Golf GTI and I may have preferred this. This is why I'm not putting my face on camera so you lot can't rip the pee for having such a, uh, a rover perversion. Yeah, I'm going to bomb through this a little bit, uh, a little bit more quickly. Um, an article on Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. This is the thing I mentioned uh, earlier. These are uh, cars that are slowly disappearing from our roads and uh, whilst the website isn't fantastically reliable about how many left, it is a good indicator um, of the, uh, the popularity of these vehicles on the roads as daily drivers today. So for example, if you look at this Parodua Nipper, um, okay, a bit of a quirky thing, but they did sell quite a few. There's only 51 of these taxed. And without looking or checking, I guarantee every one of those 51 has only got about 10,000 miles on the clock and goes to the spa shop to buy cat food and to church on a Sunday morning. I hope I'm wrong. These are great little things, but how strange that they're vanishing. This was it, the Skoda Felicia. Only 1,249 of them taxed, really? They made like billions of those things. That's a real surprise. Um, so yeah, maybe one day people will start celebrating these too, but um, well, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, some of those that are uh, beautiful rarities that we see um, fewer of here. Uh, Alpha 146, for example, the Audi V8, if you remember that, was a bit of an oddity. So big saloon from Audi, uh, late 80s, early 90s thing. Very few of these left. And just, this is a really cool feature. This is from Darren Walker. Uh, this is a Dodge Dakota pickup, which in itself is an interesting thing, but, you know, not that interesting. But look... This is a convertible. This has got a, a, <laughs> a fairly wonky looking hood on it. This came from a factory like that. So yeah, uh, as the feature says here, the, the market for leisure based pickups in Europe has been microscopic, but not non-existent. There's a Skoda Felicia Fun and the Dacia Duster, which came in a similar uh, format. But this is a really nice feature. It's a very unusual car, really nicely photographed. And uh, this is why I like this magazine. I buy this mag with my own money, even though I occasionally write for them just because I love it. This is the feature card. So this is a Mazda RX-7, and this is another one of those that may have sort of slipped your attention, and suddenly it's amazing, and it carries through that pink-gray uh, art scheme. I like to see magazines be bold with their layout and their styling. This is a really good thing to see. And it's a fairly detailed history of the, the model and uh, the whys and wherefores. But what I also like about this magazine, it'll point out faults too. So 
it isn't a, a blind worship uh, of some unaffordable thing. It's a kind of warts and all. Not that there are that many, uh, not that there are that many warts, but this is a fab fabulous car and a really good feature. So, yeah, worth it. Uh, worth it for the cover price alone, I would think. Um, story on living with a Saab 900 Aero convertible and fabulous picture of what I think is a Saab Vigan on a stick. Um, super, really like it, and uh, pleased with the magazine. And yeah, you find my words in there too. So that is Classic Retro Modern uh, Issue 21. We'll put that on the red pile along with Jalopy and with Car. Um, next up, I'm going to jump into this, which is the 1963 Motor Show Review. Um, price is two shillings, which I think is 10 pence in new money. And uh, we'll go into this in detail. So the introduction here is uh, from a Mr. L.G.T. Farmer, president of the SMOT and executive chairman of the Rover Company. Um, like, it's got two middle names, Mr. L.G.T. Farmer. Like, how many people have two middle names? Um, again, this is a bit moth-eared. I'm very grateful to, uh, to a friend of mine for lending me this. Um, I absolutely love this. I've read this so many times. Look at this on Advil. Now, Vauxhall Viva, the one litre car with a millionaire ride. Um, just brilliant. Compare the Viva with any car in its class. Worldwide test have proved its superiority on all these points. Speed, handling, steering, blah, blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> wow, brave claims. Uh, designed for out and out reliability. Um, these rusted like bilio. Um, anyway, let's bomb through. So basically, there's a couple of features in here um, talking about different cars that you may or may not have seen. But the bit that I really like is an alphabetical listing of all of the uh, the models that you can expect to see at this what it call, what it calls the Earl's Court spectacle, and it goes to show the breadth. Of offering that you could get back in 1963. So many different manufacturers. Now I appreciate that at motor shows you often get prototypes and oddities and you know spin-offs and rebadge stuff so you may see a lot of different names but the core cool product nowadays seems to be very generic and I appreciate I sound like a gammony old man doing that and maybe I am and I don't care. Um, but the breadth of offering here is fabulous. This is my favourite, <laughs> right at the start. This is an Arbath Fiat 1000. Carlo Arbath goes on producing new engines and new cars like a conjurer producing rabbits from a hat. And they win countless victories in international speed events. I've seen one of these uh, at Goodwood at the Festival of Speed. I think it was on the, the lawn for the Concours d'Elegance thingy that they do. And it was absolutely breathtaking. Tiny little coupe, beautiful shape. I don't know if these are Campanolo wheels, I'm not entirely sure. Um, Wonderful. I'm like, you probably couldn't buy one now, even if you could find one. And wonderful. Here it is at the show. Um, bombing through. AC Cobra. We're all, obviously, everybody knows about those. Alfa Romeo 2600 Sprint. So as everybody gets into the GT Juniors and step fronts and 105s and so on, you know, this was sort of the generation before a little bit bigger, more of a touring car. Um, yeah, it says here, a pleasure to see, uh, to see and to drive. Aston Martins, of course. Alvis 3 litre, and the opposite is an advert for this Alvis 3 litre Series 3, um, Alvis of Coventry. This is a brand that pretty much, I'm sorry to say, is kind of forgotten. And I don't know when they went out of business, but it couldn't have been too long uh, after this. However, I'm aware that Alvis are now actually manufacturing cars again, um, close to this spec. Uh, they had a couple of models, I think it was a 21 was the model I recall. And... They are beautiful, large, elegant, powerful uh, coupes, um, and people seem to want them again. So interesting to see life has gone full circle. I'm desperate to get a look at a new one just to see what they're like, and you know, you never see the old ones either. Mini Cooper S, £575. Oh, I know that scrap ones of these now go for 10, 20 grand or more. Crazy. Austin Mini Countryman with their wooden panel, uh, wooden bodywork on the back. My granny, who was a, a traffic warden, uh, she had one of these. And I think it failed its uh, MOT on, uh, on woodwork. Or <laughs> well, maybe that's a family story, I don't know. You're never far from the Austin car you want. Um, well, that's a pity. I don't particularly want an Austin. Uh, Austin Healy's, Austin A1100. This is alphabetical order, so excuse my waffling. Um, this is really cool. Check this. This is an Auto Union DKW F102. 
This is basically what we now know as Audi, and this is a B.M.W.700. Um, yeah, funny to see them here making um, small two-cylinder air-cooled uh, cars. Um, yeah, he says there's a luxury five-seater with 32 horsepower. Wow, and compare that to like the uh, X6M SUV monstrosities uh, that come out of uh, BMW nowadays. And they make some nice things too, before everybody bashes me in the comments. But uh, yeah, Audi, when they were modest, cool. Bristol is another uh, mark that's, uh, that's long gone. The Bond Equip GT, look at this thing. And then there's quite a lot of um, American motors in here too, which seem fairly otherworldly now, but must have seemed... I don't know, from another another galaxy altogether. Um, back in the 1960s, Buicks, Chevrolet, Chevrolet's Cadillacs, for example, um, very, very large overpower things. But there's some interesting engineer, uh, engineering innovations in here too. Well, that's the first stumble I've made in uh, one long take for this whole thing, so forgive me. Chrysler Turbo Dart. I'll read the blurb here. He says that 50 favoured motorists are getting this Pioneer turbine model on loan to help in evaluating its potential in everyday use before Chrysler make decisions on production. So this is a gas turbine engined car with 130 horsepower and a three speed auto gearbox. But look at the styling and the light. This is an amazing thing. Um, yeah, gas turbines never really made it, but back in the 60s, um, they were really all the rage as a new potential uh, technology. So cool to see this appearing at a motor show. Um, Daimler's, Citroen DS's, and some other absolute oddities. Uh, Elva, um, developed by Frank Nichols, who named the car from the French Eleva, and it really does go. Excuse my French pronunciation there. Um, and this. Air Vice Marshal Donald Bennett produces a new light grand touring car which will replace the Electron Miner. It is powered by a Triumph four-cylinder engine of 1143cc. Um, what an ugly little what of a thing that is. Um, I wonder if anybody actually bought it. Um, I wonder if anyone's actually seen one. That is absolutely solidly one for Alternative Car Magazine, uh, which you'll find from a Performance Publishing. So if, like me, you're a bit kinky for such oddities, then you'll find more of those in that mag. Um, my car's in here, yay! This is a Fiat 500. Um, mine's a 72, this of course is a 63. Baby of the immense Fiat range, the 500D has survived a shaky start to become a steady seller. Like, I don't remember the numbers, but I'm sure they sold millions, literally millions, I'm not exaggerating of these things. This is an early model, this is a D, and this has got the suicide doors with the, the hinges at the rear there. Um, they changed that in later models and a few other things. Um, what a pretty little thing. Look at this. The price is £340 plus £71 in purchase tax. So it's 411 quid on the road. And so many of us nowadays are probably paying that in, in monthly payments having a car on tick. Uh, back in the 60s you could buy a car for that. Yeah, yeah, inflation, but don't spoil my romantic dreaming, please, viewers. Um, other Fiat's in the range, they're quite a big um, range then, so the 600D is a bit bigger, Fiat 13 and 1500 saloons and the Fiat 2300, I've never ever seen one of these. Ford Anglia, that's my dad's first car, check out the right uh, rear screen on that, 41 horsepower, synchromesh gearbox, wow. Um, some Fords, the Ford Galaxy 500, I am absolutely having one of these someday, I don't care how irresponsible that is. Um, stepping to the adverts, obviously this is long, long pre-internet, and even television commercials were exceptionally rare uh, back then, uh, if they existed at all in the UK. Um, so print advertising was the way to, to reach uh, your potential customers. And here's an advert for National Fuel, and here we have some rakish chap driving uh, an E-Type Jaguar and some lady mauling him at the, uh, the petrol pumps. I love National. This was the brand, as you might know, if anybody's bought any of my book on the history of petrol stations, which probably is as boring as it sounds. National used to give away Smurfs, uh, toy Smurfs, when you bought fuel from them uh, back in the, in the 80s, I believe it was. And the, the rumor goes, which I think is true, um, that they gave a batch of these toy Smurfs away that had been painted with leaded paint, uh, which then, of course, uh, risked poisoning the little kiddies like my little sister who used to chew on them. Um, now, there we go, she's still alive and well, and working as an accountant in Melton Mowbray. Uh, Humber, another brand that's gone. Hillman have gone. 
Um, wow, so many marks that have gone to the wall. Is, uh, Iso Revolt, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. This is, of course, a very glamorous name that will crop up in the likes of Octane and so on nowadays. Lots of Jaguars. Uh, Mark 10, which was a bit of a flop, but I really, really love those. Uh, sort of designed for the US market. Wasn't big enough for the US. Uh, physically in size, didn't really get their buyers going, but was way too big for those of us in the UK. Great baddies cars. Lotus Elan, Lancia Flavia, Lincoln Continental, check out the lines on that, £4,420. Um, one of the few American cars with the unibody chassis, it says in the description here. Lagonda, Jensen CV8. Now this is super cool. We're all aware, of course, of the, the Jensen Interceptor. That's a car with a, a bit of a cult following, but this is the car that preceded it. I've only ever seen one. It's one of those cars that's kind of ugly, but really holds your attention, and is, in my opinion, really striking. So this is basically a resin-bodied or a fiberglass-bodied uh, vehicle um, with a honking great Chrysler V8 in it. So this thing has 305 horsepower. It's absolutely bonkers, a huge amount of power even for today, let alone back then. These are really brutish cars and I love them. I would love to have seen one at the show. Lotus Elan, Lincoln Continental we mentioned, adverts here. So this is the Roots range. So yeah, that basically means uh, Sunbeams, Singers, Humbers, Hillmans, that, uh, that sort of thing. This car here, this, is, uh, this was really pitched as an alternative to the Mini. Um, it has a 0 to 50 acceleration, not 60, 0 to 50 acceleration in 15 seconds, and we'll do 40 to 45 to the gallon. Like it's a pretty little thing. These things went touring. I think the guy that designed this was called Mike Parks, and I'm pretty sure he was a Formula One driver in the day. So yeah, uh, weekends racing in Formula One, day job in Coventry of designing uh, Hillman Imps, little economy cars for the masses. Um, these are quite nice looking things now, but again, sort of slipped, uh, slipped my attention at the time, and of course as a brand now, it's long gone. Lotus uh, Super 7, um, much favoured by aspiring racing drivers, of course you can still buy one of these um, basically as a caterum today, fairly close to that I would say. Mercury Monterey, wow some fabulous things. Look at this, BMC makes a car for you. 20 cars between 447 and £600, so they, they had such a colossal range. And this, I know I waffle about British Leyland quite a lot, but this is essentially what killed the company because there is too much choice. There's very little difference between, I don't know, this and this, or that and that. Okay, this is a convertible, but they had too many models, too many different engines, too many uh, complexities in producing these different models, when they really could have boiled it down to a smaller range and made them more profitable. I mean, even the Mini, allegedly, never made much of a profit. Look at how many of those they made. Um, but yeah, BMC makes a car for you. Wow. Um, Morgan, uh, this is really cool. This is the Morgan Plus 4. They don't do a Plus 4, um, so a four-seater uh, anymore. But the basic recipe and the silhouette, of course, is still very similar uh, to them. But they say here, a thoroughly, a thoroughly tested and reliable car, likely to be with us for some time to come. And, of course, they're still knocking out Plus 6s and so on uh, today. And they are awesome cars. I drove the, the latest Plus 4, which is powered by a BMW turbo engine, uh, up to Scotland um, at the back end of lockdown just for just for fun and ah oh, marvellous sort of modern underpinnings with this uh, classic wrapping over the top of it yeah four seats is a little bit uh, ungainly but hey there you go advert for the boat show I think the IRA actually bombed the boat show uh, one year I think about 10 years after this so apologies for a bit of a rough cut there I've waffled on for so long that my memory card was full and maybe that's a good time to wrap up the 63 issue of the uh, the Daily Express Motor Show review. Uh, just before I do vanish on that uh, subject, uh, check this out. This is the Skoda Octavia, a Czechoslovakian light car at a low price which has won its place on British roads. This gets quite a nice write-up actually and it's a pretty looking thing but yeah, maybe you didn't know that the, uh, the Skoda Octavia existed long before Volkswagen got their teeth into them but um, yeah, that's really cool and that my friends is a wrap-up of the 63 uh, Motor Show. Um, I really enjoyed Jalopy, um, classic retro modern is a, is a good read, I'm not going to ask about uh, car but let's take a look at this. Um, just before we go I want to talk about this, this is Punch from 1924. 
This is a pretty tatty uh, copy and I picked this up uh, actually at a, an auction on a village green in Norfolk many years ago. I collected a stack of them and to my shame I chucked quite a few away and I don't want to think about what it may or may not be worth now but it always feels bad throwing print away. Um, this magazine was sort of full of political satire and adverts and other stuff and I suppose it's like a forerunner of a magazine. You can see how tatty it is. This is literally... 99 years old, um, obviously it's it's a piece of history. Um, it is in a car magazine and I do want to just dip into it briefly because it shows the era at which cars were becoming mass market and it shows a little insight into how cars were advertised. This was uh, priced at sixpence which is quite a bit of money there. So, number one, the artwork in here is, is just absolutely beautiful. Some of it's coloured, some of it isn't. Most of this in here is black and white. Um, look at this. Adverts for pianos, for shoes. Um, the first automotive reference here is uh, adverts for Goodyear cord tyres. Um, and the language they use here is really quite sort of stilted and old. Visit the Goodyear display of tyres, rubber heels and other products at the British Empire Exhibition. 1924, the British Empire was pretty much at its peak in terms of uh, sort of global dominance, and um, I think it's fairly okay to say that one of the reasons for the uh, the British Empire was wanting to create demand overseas for British goods. That was uh, part of the the drive, uh, really. Um, and so this was kind of a, also a showcase, these shows, the British Empire exhibition was like showcasing the best of British, hoping people abroad would, would buy it. Um, only part of it, don't want to get too political on that. Um, so here, like wine and spirits, so you can get a really good uh, bottle of Chablis for four forward slash minus symbol, which I think uh, is four shillings, which I think is 20p. Um, but again, I don't even understand the money from back then. Um, I am old, but I'm not that old. Um, cigarettes, shaving foam, and here we get to the one of the first adverts in here, and this is really why I picked this up. Check this out. Power enough and to spare. This is the Austin 7. So this was the forerunner to, to BL, and this was obviously made at uh, Longbridge near to Birmingham. £165. Now, they're trying to sell a bit of a, a lifestyle, a bit of a dream with these things now. And the advert reads, Even with a family aboard, the little Austin 7 is game enough for the longest climb. The beautifully balanced engine has an astonishing reserve of power, and it is more economical than a tram fare. Wow! The Austin 7 represents the cheapest form of travel extant, and that with exceptional comfort and dispatch. Extant. This is a word... This is, I'm not particularly eloquent, but this word here, when did you ever see this word used? It, it's really uh, odd to see that, um, but also wonderful too. So it's selling like this dream of days out and picnics and stuff. And we can bomb through here because there's adverts for shoelaces and hairbrushes and dental cream and whiskey. And a couple of sort of um, social observations here for cartoons and little jokes that perhaps haven't stood the test of time uh, too well. Do your own joke about the British Empire at this point. Towards the back we have a few more adverts which I'm going to touch on. Gold flake cigarettes. For the best results fit lodge plugs. These are spark plugs. Are you fitting your own spark plugs or are you going to the garage for it? Now I really like the look of that Austin but now my attention is, is caught by this. The Supreme Sunbeam. The 12 slash 30 horsepower Sunbeam gives the motorist all the distinctive qualities of Sunbeam design, workmanship and coachmanship in a car of moderate size. It has unusually attractive appearance, it says, but there's no photograph of it. Um, wow, 30 horsepower for 570 quid. I'm now beginning to rethink, uh, rethink that Austin early, but uh, yeah, maybe we should have a Sunbeam. But then we get into this, the Bean Car Company. I don't know if you've heard of these. Um, this was... A brand, uh, again another West Midlands company, that was actually fairly big back in the day and I believe it ended up being owned by Ferromatal or somebody. I have a funny feeling that somebody still owns the right to these and might be making metal things of some flavour. But anyway, look at this chap on the telephone, a two-piece telephone here. A glorious holiday thanks to the bean. From the sunny morning when he set out to the glowing evening when he came back, he had the time of his life and all of the running cost which amazed him. Um, so I yeah, quite like the look of a bean now. A bean is 395 quid. So do I have a bean, bean, or am I going for the Sunbeam or the uh, the Austin? 
Early cars, particularly the, the luxury models, um, often had coach built bodies. So you'd buy a, a chassis from one company. If you were wealthy, you would pay a coach builder to, to fit a body. So here is an advert by Daimler, and you've just got this discreet by appointment with a royal crest there and a prestigious London address. It says simply, in addition to the comprehensive range of standard models produced by the Daimler company, we have a number of Daimlers with special coach work by leading British bodybuilders. Full specifications and photographs on receipt of your inquiry. How lovely. Um, and you can buy, look, a, a bulb horn, a Lucas King of the Road horn. Um, <laughs> oh man, when did they stop making car horns? I don't even think I have them on my push bike anymore. Uh, whiskey, multi milk, Coronas, um, and now Standard. Now here's another company, of course Standard, they lasted a bit longer than Beam I think, but I might be wrong, but I'm guessing they were swallowed up by either BL or Roots at some point, and of course, what is Standard nowadays? Well, these are cheap too, 375 quid for a 14 horsepower model, far away from everyday worries, enjoying every precious minute to the full. It's the party picnic parties and joys of the open air at holiday time that help to make life worth living. Wow. And it describes owning a standard uh, here. It has unfailing reliability with many friends and it's perfect for these pleasure jaunts. Um, well, that's a nice thing too, isn't it? So yeah, little adverts and they're really selling the dream. Um, it says here there is, um, I think it says ample seating for five full grown people. And in the picture you've actually got six people. Um, of which three are children. So yeah, no seat belts, no safety, no nothing. Not even a proper roof, just like a cabriolet fold over top, just cram all the kids in, uh, have some alcoholic drinks in the countryside and drive home. Wow, as a sign of the times. Um, yeah, a little cartoon talking about uh, being a pirate, adverts for ginger ale, and lots more. So I, I'm not gonna spend any more time on this because it is very much of an era and it's not that motoring related, but I love that we're starting to see adverts uh, appear to tempt the, uh, the the newly wealthy into buying a car instead of taking the tram. And um, there we go. I think I want to go with the Bean after all of that. I think that was the one that got my attention. So uh, yeah, that's it. Um, to sum up, last magazine in this long, rambly, badly edited podcast is going to be uh, Auto Sport from 1985. This. This was a, a regular publication. This is one from Haymarket, big media company, as you probably know. And the f primary focus of this is motorsport results, so different class of stuff. They regularly have uh, Formula One uh, reviews in here, which was uh, one of the main reasons I used to pick it up as a kid. Um, 75p, mm, there's a lot of detail in here. This must have been expensive to produce because they were sending photographers and writers all around the world to follow the motorsport stuff. Now, I'm not going to get into that a great deal in this issue. I just do, I will touch on, um, where is it now? Yeah, here we go. So this is um, the Monte Carlo Rally, which of course is uh, a hugely exciting uh, event. So you've got Walter Rawl here uh, in an early Audi Quattro, Timo Salonen in the 205. And for me, this was sort of the golden era of, of rallying, but the, the write-up, it's like every little step is described, every little cock-up, every little twist in the race is detailed in here and photographed, and it's, it's really well written. It's quite geeky, you've got to be into motorsport to get into it, but it's fabulous. Some of the adverts you can get in here as well. Um, they used to sell, uh, obviously, books on the series. They also used to sell, uh, and there's probably some adverts in the back for this, uh, videos of the season so you could buy a video cassette and they were quite expensive and it would run through the entire racing season to watch it um, yeah no catch up or online nonsense there the real reason for having this in here is a review of a Ford Fiesta now this is 1985 magazine so this is a newly launched uh, Mark II a Ford XR2, not the XR2i, this is carb powered, not, uh, not fuel injected. And check it out, it's on these uh, old school plastic uh, wheel trims here. And um, yeah, it says here, after this, other cars feel cumbersome. And it's a really good review by Mike McCarthy uh, on this, on this uh, little hot hatch. It's so smart looking. I love the dimensions. It's still kind of fairly faithful to the silhouette of the original, but the styling over the standard model, you've got to be a real Ford nerd to, to spot it, but you know, this front spoiler, 
uh, little little spotlights here. The trims are unique. The arches, of course, and some slight difference in the paintwork and so on. And of course, the engine is a bit spicier. This is the same engine that comes from the the XR3. Uh, he quite likes the engine in this. This is the CVH engine, which I remember has been an absolute pig of a thing. Like coarse sound, and you can never get it to run well or run smoothly. But perhaps that's because I never bought them new. I bought them a few years after they've been nicked and driven around the block too many times. So perhaps that's uh, a bit unfair on the XR2. But the contemporaries that it refers to here, uh, it's some fairly tough competition. There's the MG Metro Turbo, the 205 GTI, the Vauxhall Nova 1.3 SR, the Corolla 1600 GT. He says, it is a rear-wheel drive car, though. There's a hint of negativity there, whereas nowadays, of course, we all want rear-wheel drive because so few of them are done. And the Honda CRX. Um, Renault 5 GT Turbo is yet to be introduced into the UK, but the one that really... You can read uh, between the lines here. The one that he absolutely loves, of course, is the 205 GTI, which uh, the author described as being outstanding. How long will it be before Ford fit fuel injection and turn this into a real rocket, he asks. Well, I don't think it was that long. Um, absolutely wonderful write-up. Great car. Lovely to see this reviewed in period and photographed in period. And look, I've got a bit of a lean on with the photograph here. Just like Evo does today, getting the car hopping around a bit and in the air. They uh, they used to do this back in the day too. Um, so yeah, pretty good magazine. Classifieds always have some little gems uh, in here as well. And jobs, uh, I think there's a job advertiser back here at uh, Williams F1. Um, yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, jobs for sale. This is, uh, actually this is some of this Julius Thurgood. Um, yeah, Williams Grand Prix Engineering. We require a senior mechanic to take control of our testing. This is a really cool job for somebody. And, uh, you know, back in this era, 80s, you know, Williams were, were really uh, in the thick of it. Um, turbo engineering, mechanics needed, uh, body, uh, body beater, panel beater working for uh, Ferrari uh, in Egham and so on. And then a list of people rolling roadies. It's just like I can really spend ages digging into the, the adverts here. There always seems to be a lot of adverts of these American motorhomes. I'm guessing people were having these to take to support their, uh, their race events, but I'd love one now. These are the kind of things you see rotting outside a council house in, uh, in Corby or somewhere nowadays, all covered in algae and kind of, you know, worth saving but not really worth anything and nobody ever does, but I'd love one of these now. Um, an advert for some uh, Esprits and you can think, wow. I think the Esprit is massively undervalued as a as a car you, as you know you can pick up a, a fairly decent used spree for perhaps 15 20 25 grand and really that isn't a million miles from where what they were new and if you go through here and look at what for example stuff like Ford Escorts and Sierras are going for in here uh, it's comparable sort of prices but of course nowadays are worth a huge amount of money um, it is a bit strange to see uh, things like a, you know a, a basically a new Lotus Esprit Turbo um, for 18,000 quid, that does seem, uh, that does seem interesting. Um, yeah, Norfolk's XR3 Centre, and then reports, and this is a bit that I think that really must have taken them time and, and cost to produce. They're going to Lydon Hill, they're going to, uh, yeah, different stages all around the UK, and detailing uh, people, Frank Sittner, uh, of course Frank Sittner's name uh, is, is over, BMW dealerships around the world now, but he sort of started his life in racing. And then, yeah, here we are, the videos that I mentioned earlier. 25 quid for the uh, video of the 1984 Lombard RAC rally. Um, I think this is great. Uh, these occasionally also have adverts in for um, dating or dateline. Um, this is like computerised dating. I bet I won't be able to find it now. Um, where you could fill in, uh, if you were looking for love, you could fill in your details. Um, and uh, yeah, find a partner that way. That uh, was really kind of funny. And uh, I like this too. Look, you can put in a Valentine's message and they'll print it six quid. And um, as if your loved one would be reading uh, Autosport, uh, maybe they are, I don't know. Uh, check this, look, you get a free poster with this one. And uh, we've got a, this is a classy uh, Porsche racer and a nice picture of uh, of spa and the action there and check out the course car this looks like a mercedes sl in white with uh, an old school body kit on so there we go my friends that's a blast from the past everything from autosport punch classic retro modern jalopy car which i was probably a little bit unkind to and uh, the 1963 motor show review um if you enjoyed this then uh, leave me a comment let me know what you think nobody seems to be watching these but i don't care i just like the sound of my own voice um, thank you very much and maybe I'll do another one of these if there's sufficient feedback.